Good morning. We're here for the one year Bible study and it's June 23rd and we're reading in 2 Kings. Um, we're still reading about 2 Kings chapter 4 and chapter 5. Um, we're reading about Elisha still. Starts off with the story of the woman's little boy. Now this is the woman who he had been with before that had, had fed him. Um, but anyway, the little boy dies on her lap. And so I think all of us, whether we have children or we don't have children, can put ourselves in this mother's place of deep despair. I'm not sure I can think of anything more tragic than losing a child. And so it represents the deepest, darkest time in our life is what today's reading represents. is is It's when things come against us, when things aren't good, um, my back just isn't getting better. Um, my finances aren't getting better. I've lost a child. Um, this is a woman of God. She she believed because of her encounter, and she knew who Elisha was, and she knew who God was through Elisha. And so this child died, and then in verse 22, then she called to her husband and said, just send me a servant and a donkey that I can go to the man of God. And his response to her was a very typical response. And he said, why will you go to him today? Is it neither new moon or Sabbath? And, and this was her response. In other words, he's going, why do you, why are you going to the man of God? What's up? He doesn't know what's happened. And he's really just more or less saying it's not time for a, an offering. Cause back then they did sacrifices. It's not time for a sacrifice. Why are you going to the man of God? And listen to her response. So from our first reading in 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 18, all the way until we finish the Proverbs, um, there's a theme for us today. Um, and her response in chapter 23, she said, all is well. That was a, a statement of faith. All wasn't well in her world as far as the facts go. She knew that her son had just died in her arms, but she had faith in God. And so her, when she spoke, all is well. All is as it should be right now, this very moment. So we live by faith, not by sight. We call those things that are not as though they are. That's what our faith walk should look like. And this is how we're supposed to use our words, our lips, our mouth, our tongue. And then she saddled the donkey, donkey and she went on. So when uh, Elisha saw her, he sent uh, someone out to meet her and to uh, inquire of her. And Elisha wasn't getting anything from God, but he knew that her coming, there, there was something significant about her coming to him. And so he sent somebody out to ask. And her response again in verse 26, um, and she answered, all is well. All is well. She didn't deviate from what she knew was truth. She knew truth was that God was going to raise her son back up if she could just get to the man who had an uh, open door with God. She knew that. And, and remember, this is Old Testament. We have that open door with God. He lives within us all the time, you know. And then it goes on to tell the story of how Elisha goes in and he prays and then has to lay on top of the boy and pray. And then he does it a second time. He was praying to a God in heaven. We get to pray to a God within us and to the spirit that's within us. The power of the healing is within us. We're, we're not looking externally for God anymore. We, we get to go internally, but we should have the faith of this woman. All is well. All is well. Um, again, what, what is it that comes at us and that attempts to steal our joy? We, we have little things. Oh, my kids had a fight. Oh, I stubbed my big toe. Oh, my kid didn't make good grades in school. Oh, I don't know if they're going to get into college I wanted to get in. Oh, they didn't behave today. I, you know, the two little ones were fighting. I mean, it just, the list goes on and on. You know, work wasn't what I thought it was going to be. My boss, 
you know, expects more than I can ever give, or my boss is never grateful, or the work, you know, is never ending at work. I don't feel like I can accomplish anything. And all of these things are things that steal our joy, but quite frankly, none of it steals our joy like it would if our child had just died in our arms. And she was still able to speak, all is well. Wow, that's where I want to get with God. I want to get there. I want, I want this frivolous stuff to, to, to stop stealing my joy. I, what difference does it make where I live? What difference does it make if I'm on the hill or on the corner? What difference does it make if I'm in this job or the next job? I mean, the only reason I have a career at all today is because God created one, quite frankly. He created this business that I have to be a blessing. He spoke that to me so strong this morning. It's not your business, Elizabeth. It's mine. I built it. And I built it so you would bless others. That's my only role. That's my only role. I'm not supposed to worry about the finances. I'm not supposed to worry about decisions that was made last year. I'm, I'm supposed to worry about today and who am I supposed to bless today. I, I'm, I'm not supposed to let these little things steal my joy. And here's this woman. She just lost a child. None of us want to experience that. But if I was to experience that, I want to be able to say all is well. And the only way we can do that is we die to ourselves and let his spirit in us rise up and take over and we walk in the spirit. We walk in love. To walk in the spirit is to walk in love. Everything I have is his. Everything. Everything. Stop taking ownership. That car I drive is not mine. That house I live in is not mine. That bed I sleep in is not mine. That job I have is not mine. Those children that I've been gifted with are not mine. Those grandchildren I've been gifted with are not mine. They're his. And I have a role to play because he chose me to gift me with those. What's my role? I'm, I'm to be a blessing. I'm to be a blessing. And I can't be a blessing when I've blocked the blessings from God coming in. I have to be a funnel. I have to be opened up. Uh, vertically before I can ever be opened up to be a funnel to allow God's blessings to come in and pour through me this direction. It, it, it's just the way it works. And how does that happen? It happens by spending time with God. We cannot allow the busyness of our lives to stop us from spending time, closing our eyes, shutting out everything around us and saying, God, here I am. And letting that silence speak. Let, letting God speak in the silence. There's, there's those of us that can't stand to even walk into a room if it's silent. We're going to reach over and turn on the TV or we're going to reach over and we're going to turn on the radio. I mean, that right there is an indication that you've got uh, too much chaos in your life. If you can't, uh, can't stand, and the reason I can speak this because I've lived that. I've been to where I couldn't stand for 30 seconds of silence because the demons were just screaming in my head the torment that I was experiencing. And, and, and we, we have to settle ourselves. We have to get ourselves to where silence is golden. And that in our stillness, God can speak. You know, shame on me that most of the time I hear God when I'm in the bathroom. Or I hear God when I'm driving. Because that's the only two times in my life I still myself that I don't have a choice. I'm not busy because I got to go to the bathroom and take a shower or I'm going to take a bath or, or, or I'm on the pot or I'm in my car driving. I mean, really, it, it, how sad is it? Now, how much does he love us? He loves us that he'll speak to me when I'm on the pot. Now, that is the God we serve. I mean, that's just real life. That's just being real. That's real in my life. It hasn't been a month ago I came in here and told the girls that the only time that God ever talks to me is when I'm in the bathroom. <sighs> I mean, it's the truth, and praise God, he still speaks. But I don't want it to just be that I hear him when I'm in the bathroom. I want it to be that I hear him all the time. I, I praise God, and I thank him that he's faithful when I'm in the bathroom. And I thank God that he's faithful when I'm driving in my car and I have it turned on the radio. But I, I, it needs to be way more than just, just those times. So then that... Um, goes on with the story of Naaman in, in Kings, uh, starts chapter 5, and we're going to read the story about Nahum, 
and this is the uh, I don't I don't know his title, but he he was a leader in the army that was very successful uh, for the king, and because of his battles, I'm sorry, commander. He was a commander. Thank you. He was a commander in uh, the king's army, the king of Syria's army, and he got favor with the king of Syria because he won so many battles. Um, and uh, but he had leprosy. So here he's had, and back then, I mean, do a little historical Google on leprosy back in the day. I mean, you were shunned if you had leprosy. It was, it was the ultimate. It was the don't touch them, don't be around them, don't let them in your house, don't let them around you, don't let them around your kids. Leprosy was the worst of the worst back then. And Naaman had leprosy. And then, uh, uh, I love this story because um, in chapter in, in chapter five verse two, now the Syrians on one of their raids had carried off a little girl from the land of Israel, and she worked in the service of Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, "Would would that my lord were with the prophet, speaking of Elisha, he would cure him of his leprosy." So out of the mouth of babes, this little girl who had been ripped away from her mom and dad, taken to a foreign country, serving. She was in servanthood. She was in bondage. She was a slave to this man. And, and yet she spoke words of life to him. Once again, we let the chaos in our life that we get into this, woe is me. Oh, poor pitiful me. Oh my gosh, <laughs> my life's so bad. God can't use me. God won't use me. I have nothing good to say for anybody. I'm not able to be a witness to anybody. I can't speak to life. I need somebody to speak life to me. My life is so bad. I, just, I need, I need, it's me, 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 me all the time. And here's this little girl who doesn't even have her mom and dad anymore. And she says, why isn't Naaman healed? And so from those words of life, once again, remember the theme I told you about? Those words of life, this little girl speaks, and Naaman for the first time gets up the courage to go to see the prophet, to go see Elisha. And so he approaches Elisha, he sees Elisha, and he tells him to go dip in the pool and he'll be healed. And what was Naaman's response? Oh, and I love this, guys. Get this. Naaman's response was, well, I'm just going to be ticked off. He should have laid hands on me, waved his hand, and I should have had instant healing, instant gratification, instant right now. I want it fixed. I want it to look the way I want it to look. By golly, I drive, I drive so far. I traveled so far. And he didn't even drive in an air-conditioned car. He had to be on a donkey or a horse or whatever out in the heat. And he drove all that way, rode all that way to get to Elisha. And by golly, Elisha just didn't do exactly what he thought it should look like, what it should feel like. And then once again, his servant, his servant. I mean, what makes you think you can't speak to your boss? What makes you think you can't talk to the president of the company? What makes you think that the words that God is putting in you to speak aren't of God and will be received because once we have the unction from God to speak out, it already means that the Holy Spirit has gone before and prepared the way. He's not going to have you speak if, if already the preparation by the Holy Ghost hadn't taken place. The little girl spoke, but Nahum's heart was already there. He was ready to receive the word she spoke. And Nahum's heart was ready to receive the words of his servant when he said, why are you, why are you mad? I mean, he, he says you're going to be healed. Is that not what you came for? It does it really <laughs> matter if it's a wave of your hand or a dip in the pool. Are you going to walk away from healing? And, and it settled in Nahum's spirit and he knew he was right and he went and he dipped in the pool and he was healed. Boy, I mean, again, guys, let this figure into your own life. How we do that. We get so caught up in our mumbling and complaining. We get so caught up in our self-pity. And, well, I'm just not getting promoted as fast as I would. I'm just not recruiting as many people into the fold as I thought. I'm just not. This isn't happening. It's not. Look, I've prayed. I've prayed. And, and I've asked God. And God, didn't, God, God didn't, didn't answer me. Either. Number one, we give up and we don't have faith that all is well. And we just forgive up, forget about our prayers. God, 
God never forgives, forgets, but we forget. Or he didn't answer quite on our timeline. And so we get frustrated and angry and step back at to self-pity like what Nahum was doing. Or worse yet, he doesn't answer it the way we think it should be answered. I mean, oh, again, oh, the wisdom of me thinking that the answered prayer looks like this and God answered it like this because his way is always better than ours ways. Always better. Um, it just, it powerful words today, powerful stories. Um, and then in Acts uh, chapter 15, we're reading in Acts chapter 15. Get refreshed with what I read. Oh, this is about Paul and Barnabas. I, I, I love verse uh, verse nine. Um, well, okay. Oh, oh, I remember. I remember. Sorry, it took me just a minute. Acts chapter fifteen is just a typical story of how division happens. A little, a little topic, which in this particular case probably wasn't really a little topic, but in God's eyes, it was definitely a little topic. But in these men's eyes, it was the end all of all, um, and you know, issues just exactly like what they're talking about. And they're talking about circumcision, the law of cir circumcision and whether somebody that's not circumcised can actually be saved or not. Uh, just, just a few days ago, we were reading about whether or not the baptism was uh, that anyway, I, I, when I read this instantly, what come up is how many churches has been divided over sprinkling versus submersion. Um, has been divided over the way we do the communion and not, or how many churches have been divided over what kind of music we play mm. or how long the preacher preaches or uh, divisions on how we treat uh, divorcees in our church or divisions over how we treat homosexuals in our church or division. I mean, from the smallest thing to the way we cover communion for our communion service to great big huge things about how we treat the homeless person that walks in off the street to come into our church divides our churches and we branch off and you know this church goes astray that church goes astray they form their own and that's why I, I don't even know the numbers of different denominations that we have um, but it's vast and and in our own homes in our own lives you know a little bitty thing can cause such a division you know starting in our home with our children um feeling in our hearts that there is a division because i'm going to stand strong and i'm going to discipline my child but i'm so afraid that that child's going to reject me that i choose not to discipline i mean that's it's the same kind of a thing it you know right is right and wrong is wrong and Paul and Barnabas was doing everything they knew to do to try to, to convince them of the grace of God. It was all about grace and it's no longer about the law. And we, so we see even then among the apostles, the, the disciples themselves um, was the temptation for division. And that was the story today uh, about circumcision. And it's a, it's just so relevant to today's environment because we allow the little things to trouble us and the little things um, to separate us. And in verse 24, since we've heard that some persons have gone out from us and troubled you with words, unsettling your minds. So again, this is in this division over circumcision and some chose to separate themselves away from them but this was so powerful this morning, since we have heard that some persons have gone out from us and troubled you with words. Who's troubling you with their words? Who do you have in your life that when they speak, you walk away and the torment starts again? We can't allow that to happen in our, in our, in our life. And, and, and even worse than that is who do you speak to that when they walk away from you, they're troubled. I, I mean, it's our words. We, we just don't, once again, that theme, told you from beginning to end today, the theme is about our words, what we speak, what we're speaking to others. And it said, and it has seemed good to us having come to one accord. 
Now, we want to come to one accord. The Bible tells us to pursue, to pursue peace. We've talked about the fact that we take peace into the chaos. We don't compromise to have peace. We don't compromise to come to one accord. Paul didn't compromise. Paul knew the truth, and Paul stood on the truth, even if it meant division among the disciples, even if it meant division among the church he planted. He stood for truth, and that's what we stand for. We stand for truth, and we don't own the chaos of the others. If I speak the truth and I have truth to offer, and they choose not to take it, don't participate in the chaos. Don't engage. Engaging feeds the chaos. Into one accord, one accord. Who our inner circle of people should be, it's absolutely essential that we're of one accord. Kelly and I was just talking about that this morning. One accord. Um, no strife, no struggles. One accord. Um, and the power of our words is how that happens. And I've got verse 29 highlighted, that you abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols and from blood and from what has been strangled and from sexual immorality. Oh, I mean, it was just really simple uh, what, he, what he had told them that they did have to do. Here they were wanting to get all up in arms over circumcision, and he's just telling them, you know, it's very simple what God's requiring from a state. The law has been fulfilled. Um, if we'll just walk in the grace of what God's given us, walk in the grace. And then Psalms 141 verses one through 10. And I want to focus just on verses three and four. Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. I could say that a thousand times a day. I need to say that a thousand times a day. If I stopped and thought of how many times in the last week I spoke when I wasn't supposed to speak. I did it just yesterday, just, just yesterday evening. Yesterday evening, I spoke on a topic that God had told me to be still on, and the consequence in the moment wasn't good. Praise God, it wasn't long-lasting. I didn't feed it. Once I realized I had erred, then I immediately to myself asked God's forgiveness for it, uh, and then, I, then I, I stilled myself. Set a guard, O Lord, over Elizabeth's mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Do, lot, do not let my heart incline to any evil, to busy myself with wicked deeds. That word busy, God's dealing with me about my busyness. Going from one thing to another, to another, to another, to another, and I'm too busy to enjoy this wonderful life he's given me. Uh, to in company with men who work iniquity and let me not eat of their delicacies. Do not eat of the delicacies of the wicked people around us in that we have a shield that comes up, a shield of faith that comes up when their evil words start coming at us. We don't let it penetrate us. We do not participate. We do not engage in the chaos. We, we silence ourselves. We remain silent and we allow God to take over. Anything outside of our little uh, uh, shield of faith that he's put around us is not our responsibility. It is not my responsibility. When the unction comes and I'm supposed to word, speak a word of faith to this person, I'm responsible only for the word of faith I spoke, not for the response that comes from it. God's responsible for the response. I'm responsible for my own little inner circle of peace. And when I don't have peace, then I'm out of alignment with him and I need to get back into alignment with him. And Proverbs 17, 23, the wicked accepts a bribe in secret to pervert the ways of judgment. We can't compromise. That's just about compromise. I can't sit and gossip with this person thinking, oh, well, it's not going to hurt anything. The words of our lips is very powerful. And the words that our ears hear has power to our inner peace. So I thank you for reading, uh, being faithful in your daily readings. I thank you for being faithful to the morning Bible study telecons. And we'll chat soon.